Hello, and uh, thank you for tuning in to Legal Aid Explained, a project of the Greater Chicago Legal Clinic. I'm pleased today to be joined by the supervising attorney of the clinic's domestic violence program, Zulmira Paredes. Zulmira, thank you for being with us yeah, today. No, thank you for having me. Um, we'll get right to the point because uh, the point of this particular program is to explain to our viewers what it is uh, we do and what kind of legal services we provide and what they can expect if they land in a particular uh, legal situation. Um, and your specialty, as I noted earlier, is domestic violence. Um, and I wanted to talk a little bit about the, the program that uh, GCLC provides. Um, Tell me what the program does for uh, victims of domestic violence, uh, both in terms of legal services and also in terms of connecting folks with other services. Sure. So our aim at the project is to help survivors of domestic violence with their unique legal needs. What this means is oftentimes representation in orders of protection matters, mm -hmm. family law matters, and immigration matters. What we find is that survivors of domestic violence often have many unmet needs, legal needs, and we pride ourselves on being able to address multiple needs all in one place. So them. holistic approach. Holistic approach, yes. Um, now, you have a particular background in, in domestic violence prior to coming to the clinic. Um, can you explain what sort of legal structures in uh, Cook County exist to protect victims of domestic violence? Sure. So here in Cook County, we have a domestic violence courthouse, which I think is pretty unique. It sits apart from other um, legal uh, courthouses, I guess, where you would go for, you know, civil suits or traffic violations, criminal court. It's specifically set up for domestic violence survivors, and that is usually where our cases um, come out of. So all of the judges at the domestic violence courthouse in, in downtown Chicago are specially trained to hear domestic violence cases. So I, I like to think that they're a little bit better attuned to the needs of domestic violence survivors than, you know, your typical judge. I see. And where's that located? At 555 West Harrison okay. in downtown. Um, from the perspective of somebody who might be a victim of domestic violence, um, what would you advise them to do uh, to uh, achieve a greater degree of safety to deal with this situation? Sure. So first and <clears throat> foremost, um, you know, we can assist with their legal needs, but somebody can't really address their legal needs if they're not in a safe situation, right? First and foremost, having a safe place to lay your head to sleep at night. So what we usually recommend is that if they are at the very outset of trying to escape the situation that they're in, um, they can call the Illinois Domestic Violence Hotline to uh, to get resources in their area for shelter, for that type of um, assistance. And then once that is settled, then they can address their legal needs, which usually um, require, you know, greater attention and that's something that you can't really address if you're not even sure where you're going to spend the night. Right. So um, safety comes before everything else and the law and legal options available to people in that situation reflect that. So what's your first procedural tool for achieving safety for somebody who is in a crisis, a domestic violence crisis? So if it is an emergency situation, there are emergency orders of protection that they can apply for. Um, usually a survivor could go down in person to the domestic violence courthouse and apply same day. They will be heard by a judge, assuming they come early enough in the day. Um, and they could walk out of court that same day with an emergency order of protection, which would provide that immediate sense of um, safety for them. So what does an emergency order of protection guarantee? What does an emergency order of protection it's, establish? It's supposed to prevent um, further harassment, physical violation, or physical um, abuse, intimidation, interference with personal liberty by the abuser. Um, emergency orders are good for between 14 to 21 days. I refer to them when I'm speaking with clients as a band-aid. They're not meant to be a permanent solution, but they provide that immediate sense of safety while they seek what's called a plenary order of protection, which would be good for up to two years. Got you. So um, how 
would you go about after obtaining an emergency order of protection if it needs to be enforced how would you go about enforcing the order so with an emergency order or with a plenary order if you have that if there's a violation you call the police mm -hmm. right to report it and then the um reaction of the police will oftentimes depend on the violation. Is the abuser still there when the police arrive, right? If they are, then their response might be different than if the abuser has already fled. But assuming any type of violation of an order of protection is criminal, and so there could be criminal charges placed against that individual for violation. Okay, and so as you are stating in a, in, a, in a case that rises to the level of a criminal offense, violation of an order of protection, your first line of defense after you've obtained an emergency order of protection is the police. Yes. Um, so that's important, I think, for people to know and to understand. Um, and you've also drawn a distinction between that first emergency order of protection and, and a plenary order of protection. So let's, uh, let's back up. Um, in a hypothetical situation, you've obtained your emergency order of protection on a client's behalf. Um, what are the next steps? At that point, presumably, you can turn your attention to the actual substance of the case and, and what's required in order to have a successful uh, legal representation. So, so what's next? So a lot of what follows is procedural. Um, as you may have seen on TV or in movies, when a case is started against somebody, you need to serve them with that case to inform the other party that this legal proceeding is in place and they have an opportunity to come into court and defend themselves, present their side of the story. So similar situation here with an order of protection. The respondent, as they're called, um, would have the opportunity to be in court as well and defend their position, which is often, you know, we don't need this order of protection because I did nothing wrong. So there are um, a few different ways that an order of protection case can be resolved. Um, if there's no agreement that can be reached between the parties, you know you do go up to a hearing in front of the judge. And so what we would do is prepare our client to testify in front of the judge about what has brought them into court to seek this order of protection. Um, really important to present a pattern of the abusive behavior and present any witnesses that they may have or any evidence that they may have. And also prepare them for the fact that the respondent will have the same opportunity, you know, to testify on his or her behalf and present any witnesses or evidence that would, you know, exculpate them from the charges mm -hmm. that are being brought. What are some examples of witnesses and evidence that might be presented on both sides? So um, for our <clears throat> client, the petitioner, a witness may be, you know, a family member that was present during one of the instances of physical abuse. Um, you know, the parent or, you know, sibling that was present who actually called the police to report what was happening. Evidence could include text messages um, of threatening behavior, uh, emails, photos of physical harm that were taken. And... Similarly, for the respondent, evidence that they may provide would be, you know, I guess it's kind of hard to disprove a negative, right? Mm -hmm. But it could also be witnesses that could maybe throw into doubt the petitioner's side of the story. Right. You know, right. she's claiming that I hit her, but to this person, it seemed like she just tripped, for right. example. So you talk about um, preparing clients for what the respondent might present in court um, and I that's part of your job right is is that they they might present uh, arguments that could be triggering that could be um, that could bring up trauma or cause new trauma and that unfortunately is is just part of the process. Right. Uh, you have to be prepared to have your honesty, your credibility called into question, and sure. that's just an unfortunate reality of our yes. system. Um, but uh, as attorneys, we counsel our clients on how to be prepared for that and how to um, weather that, at least mm -hmm. in the short term. Right. And that is something that I make, I try to explain fully at the outset, even before we engage in full representation during our initial consult. 
Um, oftentimes people call just wanting information on an order of protection, but for a variety of reasons, they're not ready to take that step and actually file in court. And oftentimes it's because it is a fairly drawn out process. And if, again, if other needs of theirs aren't being met yet, then that might not be something that they have the energy or the time to dedicate to, especially because like you said, it can often be um, re-traumatizing to, you know, just relive, having to relive everything. Right. Um, that's where experience and training come in as an advocate. Can you talk a little bit about, uh, about the training uh, a domestic violence advocate attorney uh, should go through in order to do this kind of work? So I think the most basic thing that um, one can do is what's called the 40-hour domestic violence training. It's available for not just attorneys, but what we call advocates, people who are non-attorneys who work with domestic violence survivors. Um, what this looks like in the domestic violence courthouse is essentially a support person that um, you know, walks into court with you and just provides that you know, physical solidarity that survivors often need to you know recount what has happened to them in front of a judge mm -hmm. um so that 40 hour training is the is sort of the industry standard yes i, yeah. I think so um so we've talked about uh, people uh, in, in romantic relationships who uh, may be subject, uh, or experience, subject to or experiencing domestic violence. Uh, what are some other categories of people that an emergency or plenary order of protection can apply to? So orders of protection only apply to either um, romantic partners or household members who have been abused. So most often we see it happen between romantic partners or exes, you know, married, not married. But it could also happen between parents and children. You know, the child is being abused by the parent or the parent is being abused by the, by the child. And when it comes to defining um, abuse, what constitutes abuse, um, I think we all unfortunately have uh, some basic ideas of, of, of what uh, physical abuse might look like, um, what sexual abuse might look like. Um, what are some other ways that, um, that abuse might be defined for purposes of this kind of work? So abuse can also include uh, verbal, mental, psychological abuse, financial abuse is also very big. Um, so if you're able to establish a pattern of any of that, oftentimes what we see is it's a combination of those different types of abuses that would all qualify as domestic violence. Okay. Um, so that, I think that's helpful for people to understand that, that it's not just necessarily physical injury, it's not necessarily um, sexual abuse, that, that there are a variety of other circumstances that, that could endanger your well-being mm -hmm. for which you uh, deserve protection. Um, one of the things that I think is most interesting about uh, the work we do in the field of domestic violence is the intersection uh, between uh, domestic violence law and in immigration status, immigration law. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I'm wondering if you could talk about that, how uh, domestic violence and immigration law interact to uh, uh, create new categories of, of protection potentially for, for uh, people we serve. Sure. So um, when speaking about domestic violence, you know, there's physical, mental, there's also threats, right? And what we see oftentimes when there's a, um, a marriage, for example, between a documented spouse, a U.S. citizen, and an undocumented spouse, is that the undocumented spouse's immigration status is used against them. Um, th there's threats, there's um, threats of having them deported, of calling the government to have them deported, of taking their children, if there are children involved. Um, being an undocumented person, if you are alone in this country, you know, you're already isolated and the abusive spouse can increase that isolation by basically locking them in the home, not letting them out, just creating a very um, real sense of dependency on them. And so a lot of times immigrant survivors of domestic violence are left, you know, without many options. And so immigration law provides a very specific form of relief under the Violence Against Women Act for those spouses. If you are married to a U.S. citizen and that U.S. citizen has 
um, been a domestic abuser, you can essentially file a self-petition and that puts you on a pathway to a green card. Um, without getting too far into the weeds with all of this, um, in immigration law most often if you are trying to uh, obtain legal status for your spouse, you would file a family petition and that kind of ties you to your U.S. citizen spouse. VAWA allows for the survivor to take that step on their own without having to rely on the, on the domestic abuser, which is often a form of control that is used by the abuser. You know, you can't leave me because I won't file for your papers, or if you leave me, I'll call ICE to have you deported. So the government is aware that this happens, that this dynamic occurs, and so it provides this very specific pathway for spouses, but also for parents of U.S. citizen abusers and also children of U.S. citizen abusers. Um, so Violence Against Women Act, which uh, you often will refer to as VAWA or hear people refer mm -hmm. to as VAWA, um, say somebody does self-petition in, in those situations which gets you on a path uh, to potentially a green card. Mm -hmm. um, what other protections might that person acquire as a result of, of filing that kind of a petition? So once you file, um, what USCIS does is they do what's called a prima facie determination. And if they find out that you meet the minimum eligibility requirements, they'll issue a notice. And with that notice, uh, the immigrant could essentially um, qualify for certain state benefits that they otherwise wouldn't be able to access. And that's very important in domestic violence situations, like we spoke about before. Oftentimes, um, housing, security is an issue, food is an issue, and so this opens up opportunities for them to, you know, take care of those needs. Okay. And um, if you could just run down, in case anybody out there is wondering uh, whether or not these protections apply to them, run down the category of people uh, who might be eligible, again, for uh, protection under that provision. So under VAWA, you need to either be married to a U.S. citizen or a permanent resident, mm -hmm. um, the parent of a U.S. citizen, or the child of a U.S. citizen or legal permanent resident. Mm -hmm. um, if it's marriage, and that's oftentimes the types of cases we have, you need to be married and you must prove that you entered into that marriage in good faith. So what that essentially means is that regardless of what happened after marriage, at the moment that you two got married, you did so with the intention of establishing your life together. Uh, you also have to prove that you lived together with your abuser, um, that you live currently in the United States, and that you are a person of good moral character. Okay. For at least three years. So very important uh, information for anybody who thinks that they may qualify for, for these kinds of protections. Um, turning back to um, domestic violence and, and the services we provide in general, we've talked uh, about orders of protection. Um, we've talked about the difference between an emergency and a plenary, um, and we've talked about uh, methods of enforcement. Talk to me about uh, what happens, uh, and I'm sure there are a variety of answers to this because we have all kinds of cases that are resolved in a variety of different ways, but talk to me a little bit about what might happen after we get beyond this initial um, procedural stage of, of determining um, order of protection status. What what comes next potentially for a DV client of, of GCLC at that point? So if they have received their order of protection, um, then we discuss what other needs there may be. Um, Sometimes it's immigration, you know, once they have that order of protection in hand, that's a useful piece of evidence that we can then use to establish that they have been subject to domestic violence. Um, it could also be family law related, right? Once they have that order of protection and they feel that immediate sense of safety, they maybe they can then turn to, you know, divorcing the abusive spouse or establishing um, parental responsibilities if they are not married but have children in common. Okay. So that's, um, that's an important point. Um, in addition to our uh, DV work specifically at, at the clinic, we have a thriving family law practice. 
and that is often related to the initial DV point of contact. Mm -hmm. if, if what needs to happen next in an abusive marriage, for example, is that somebody needs to obtain a divorce, we can help with that. Yeah, yeah, and that's, I think, one of the main goals of the Domestic Violence Project, to be able to, you know, have the survivor work directly with one attorney or, you know, maybe two here at the clinic to be able to really address all of their legal needs as, you know, as many as they, as they have that we can fully address. Okay. And um, just a quick pivot then to the area of immigration, which we've already been discussing in terms of how it intersects with DV. Um, you're also an immigration practitioner at the clinic. Correct. Um, and I'm wondering if uh, you could give us a quick rundown of the different uh, types of immigration uh, legal services that the clinic provides. Although you're not the supervisor of that program, <laughs> sure. you are a member of that sure. program. Um, so we do VAWA, as we've already discussed. Um, we also assist people in applying for U visas, mm -hmm. which can also be a legal remedy for victims of, of domestic violence. Um, I believe the majority of our practice deals with family immigration law. So that is either assisting people in bringing family members from abroad to live legally in the United States or assisting people who are already living in the United States to um, legalize their immigration status so that they're no longer undocumented or out of status. And then my colleagues, Ina Winston and Joel Stopka, are also assisting um, a variety of populations with asylum claims right now, which has, has you know, has really um, become a very, it's always been a hot topic, but there's a lot more focus on it right now. Right, because uh, we have uh, several international global political situations that yes. have resulted in mm -hmm. a, a surge in refugees, yes. Afghanistan, for example. Right, Venezuela as well, mm -hmm. yes. Yeah. Um, well, that's fascinating, um, and uh, we, we, I know I speak for uh, the leadership of the organization when I say we're lucky to have you, uh, you. as part of our staff. You have a really unique uh, combination of, of skill sets that has really served the organization uh, very well. Um, I'm wondering uh, if in the uh, small amount of time we have left, you could tell us a little bit about why you do this uh, work and uh, what motivates you. Sure. Um, I didn't really set out to kind of quote unquote specialize in domestic violence. It just kind of happened over time. Um, but I find it very rewarding to help people with my unique skill set, you know, to put it to good use and assist people who are trying to escape abusive situations when at the end of the day they're just trying to create safe environments for themselves and oftentimes for their children. Um, I've been working with domestic violence survivors for over 10 years now, um, mostly in immigration and now here at the clinic in family law and domestic relations, and I think it's a really unique and great um, service that we can provide to be able to holistically, like you said earlier, um, assist survivors who oftentimes um, have a lot of trouble seeking help from anywhere. And so the fact that we can assist them, not just with one legal need, but you know, in theory, three different types of areas, if not more, mm -hmm. that I find that really rewarding. And um, you know, it's what drew me to the Greater Chicago Legal Clinic, and I'm happy to be a part of it and contribute it any way I can. Well, we're pleased to have you. Um, one last point uh, I think is uh, worth bringing up, and, and that's um, our relationship with other organizations who do this kind of work. Um, and, and, and we talked a little bit about the holistic approach. Um, if uh, during the course of a representation, it becomes clear that somebody needs services beyond uh, legal services, whether those be therapy, counseling, or some other form of crisis intervention. Are we equipped to, uh, to connect a client with those services? We, we are. Um, we don't personally, again, um, offer those services, but there are a lot of legal aid agencies in the city of Chicago that do provide services beyond legal aid. And so we are able to make those referrals when needed. Um, and oftentimes we find that people come to us 
from those same organizations, um, you know, having been referred to us for their legal needs after already receiving mental health counseling elsewhere. Right. Um, also a very important aspect of what we do. Um, well, uh, Zomira, I, Zomira, I appreciate uh, greatly you taking the time to speak with us. I know you have a busy uh, practice, um, and uh, I'm hopeful that the uh, information that we've gone through today is uh, helpful to uh, some of you who may have tuned in. Uh, and uh, we appreciate your time and, uh, and wish you uh, a good rest of your day, and we'll see you next time on Legal Aid Explained.